Joining me to discuss the impact of this monumental shift in U.S.-Cuban relations is Jeffrey Goldberg, national correspondent for The Atlantic, who is the last American journalist to interview Fidel Castro, Julia Swig, director for Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, and Mike Gonzalez, an expert on Cuba who lived there for 12 years. President Obama uh, vowed to engage rogue nations like Cuba even before his presidency began. Take a listen to the president's response before he became president when he was asked about meeting with countries like Cuba in a 2007 presidential debate right here on CNN. I would. Uh, and the reason is this, that the notion that somehow not talking to countries uh, is punishment to them, uh, which has been the guiding uh, diplomatic principle of this administration, is ridiculous. So it's not as if this is unexpected if you listen to what he was going to say before he, he ran, uh, before he became president, Mike. Uh, no, I mean, look, there's no question this has been on his bucket list for a long time. This is, he sees this as part of his legacy. He's now, he will not have another encounter with the American people at the ballot box. He's been liberated. So he's going, he's going to do whatever he wants. There's a question for Congress here. Uh, the Helms-Burton Act of 1996 says very clearly the lift of the embargo is solely the responsibility of Congress. Obama cannot act on his own. Now, we know that he likes to act on his own, but we will see what the reaction of Congress is. Also, with appointing an ambassador, any senator can put, put a hold on that. Can, they can delay uh, spending on the embassy. Congress should take a leading role here now. So this isn't a done deal. I mean, President Obama can say what he wants, and he's lifting this, and he's allowing that. But at the end of the day, is it possible that in two years we'll be here and nothing really will have changed? No, I, I don't think we'll be looking back two years from now and saying, oh, that was just a flash in the pan. He has the executive authority to do all of the things that he said he was going to do today, the diplomatic relations, the flexibilization of travel without lifting the travel ban, without going to Congress to undo legislation or pass new legislation. He's going to start a process of removing Cuba from the terrorist list, of allowing Americans to in invest in the small business community growing there, all of that with his executive what about, authority. What about what Mike said about the, it's the responsibility of Congress to lift the embargo? Well, this is a perennial debate about who has the foreign policy authority in this country, isn't it? And it is true that, as Mike says, in order to lift the embargo, in order to nullify Helms-Burton, that will require an act of Congress. But when Helms-Burton was passed, it left into law some flexibility for that presidential authority, which we see him clearly prepared to exercise. He also said he wants to consult with Congress, but I think we know with a Republican majority in the next two years, this is a legacy-grabbing moment for this president. Well, more than, more than discuss it with Congress, I think he was inviting in his comments a debate an open debate with Congress. Look, he's free man. He's not running for anything anymore. Um, and I think he understands the polling has shown that this issue doesn't resonate with Americans the way it used to. I think he thinks he has a winning issue. It's very, very easy for him to make the argument to the American people that we should have relations with Cuba the same way we have relations with Vietnam, China, and other repressive regimes. Let's talk about whether or not it's going to work. Jeffrey, you were there in March, is that right? Last time I was there was this March. So yeah. do you think that this will actually help bring freedom and democracy and human rights to but, Cuba? Uh, you know, I, it, there's, a, there's a strong possibility that that is true. I wouldn't want to say yes, of course, because the government has a vested interest there in, in maintaining one-party rule. However, it is a small country, 11 million people, that lives right underneath a, the, the, a, an incredibly large and powerful country with huge cultural influences, huge business influences. It's going to be very hard to stop the flood of information, the, the, the flood of goods, once it starts. Mike. We do half a trillion dollars worth of business with China every year. It is our second biggest trading partner. The Chinese are not free. Bao Tong, the Nobel Peace Prize, is in prison. Um, at the, at the, uh, China bullies Hong Kong and puts anybody who speaks their mind in prison. What we have done now, what Obama has done, he's thrown a landline to a regime that was on the ropes because it's sugar daddy, Venezuela, has, does not get money now because of the plunging oil prices is because, and because socialism is inane and, and, and Venezuela has run its economy into the ground. Let me just let, let, me let Julie have the last what word. What I want to say is, the question is, is this going to work? Right. What is, it, what is the objective? I think that we can reasonably say that 
Cuba is becoming, and because of the in inflection of American presence, will become a more open society. Will there be a multi-party democracy there the day after tomorrow or two years from now? I think we should be very circumspect about that. It is a one-party ruled country. It is a very uh, closed uh, media environment. But all of that in the last five years has become more fluid, and I believe it will state. become more so now. It is a police state that will continue to use terror to get its way. We are. Obama is trying to do business with a brutal dictator that beats up middle-aged women walking down the street. This is shameful. All right. Jeffrey Goldberg, Julius Weig, and, and Mike Gonzalez, thank you so much. Appreciate it.